Andrew Warhola was born August 6, 1928, in a two-room shanty in a ghetto of Pittsburgh to Julia and Andrzej Warhola, who were Carpatho-Russian immigrants from Makova in the Slovak Republic of the former Czechoslovakia. Andy's father, a construction worker, joined other Carpatho-Russian workers who had left the poverty and threatened conscription of their native Makova for jobs in Pittsburgh, where life revolved around the Byzantine Catholic Church. Andy, the youngest of Julia and Andre's three boys, was baptized in the St. John Chrysotom Byzantine Catholic Church, where the family regularly worshipped. From childhood through his college years, Andy attended the lengthy Byzantine church services. Andy had three nervous breakdowns, called St. Vitus's Dance, when he was a child, spaced a year apart, at ages 8, 9, and 10. His father had tuberculosis and was ill and housebound from 1939 until his death in 1942. The two older brothers were away much of the time, which left Andy at home with his mother. From fifth grade on, Andy went to the free Saturday art classes at the Carnegie Museum. Classes at the Carnegie gave Andy his first exposure to traditional art. He was admitted to the Carnegie Institute of Technology at the age of 16, where he enrolled in the Department of Painting and Design. Upon graduation, he moved to New York. Throughout the 1950s and 1960s, Warhol did a variety of commercial art projects and book illustrations. He became a sought-after, successful illustrator of chic fashions. In the early 60s, Andy did his first pop paintings, which soon afterwards catapulted him into fame. At the same time, he expanded his artistic interests to other media. In 1963, he began making films while working on his pop paintings, and in 1966, he began collaborating with the rock music group called The Velvet Underground. In November 1963, Warhol moved all his painting equipment into a loft on East 47th Street that would soon become The Factory. Filled with Warhol's art, music, and constant activity, The Factory attracted artists, college students, celebrities, New York lowlife, and photographers who documented the scene. Warhol's fame turned into notoriety during the later 60s. It was during this period that one of his former film stars, the deranged Valerie Solanas, walked into the factory on June 3, 1968, and fired three shots at him at close range. The 1970s were years of extraordinary productivity for Warhol in film, silkscreened works, his magazine Interview, and the writing of his book, The Philosophy of Andy Warhol. In addition, he became sought after as an interior designer who worked with famous architects and clients. Significantly, the decade before Warhol's death began with the creation of his skull paintings of 1976 and ended with his 1986 series on The Last Supper. In this last decade, he went from the theme of death and dissolution to the theme of redemption. Warhol, previously diagnosed with gallbladder problems, was admitted to a New York hospital following bouts of persistent abdominal pain. Surgery the next day was successful, but his condition deteriorated during the night until he had become blue and had only a feeble pulse. The emergency team could not revive Warhol, who was pronounced dead at 6.30 a.m. on Sunday, February 22nd, 1987. The Warhol Living Room, 1946-47. One of Warhol's earliest paintings of the family living room shows a crucifix on the mantel above the fireplace. He left out his mother's holy pictures, but he put the cross from Dad's funeral on the fireplace where he always kept it. Thus, Andy's earliest experience of art was of religious art. For Andy, Art and religion were linked from a very early age. 
Mother and Child, 1948. The traumatic experience of his father's illness and death and his mother's emergency surgery for cancer and her complicated convalescence, along with his own childhood confinement as a result of three breakdowns, left Warhol with a pervasive fear of death and disaster. The early drawing of Mother and Child shows an Andy-like child in the tender and protective embrace of his mother. The child clings to her, but looks warily and fearfully at us. Praying Hands, 1950s. In Warhol's early drawing after Albrecht Dürer's Praying Hands, he transformed the aesthetic-looking hands of the German master into supple, sensuous hands of a youth. Untitled, Golden Hand with Kresh, 1957. Warhol's beautiful drawing of a hand holding a Christmas crèche shows both the fanciful originality of Warhol's imagination and the evidence of his knowledge of art of the past. In this drawing of a golden hand holding the tiny crèche within its palm, the Virgin is seated on the ground with the nude Christ child lying across her knees, a type called the Virgin of Humility, which originated in Sienese 14th century art. The drawing is encrusted with commercially confected gold embossed decorations used for the halo of the Virgin, the cherub who flutters above, the star, and the leaves in the foreground. The golden hand gently supports its little burden. One recognizes Andy's narrow, long fingered hand, which curves protectively about the Virgin and child. The intimacy with which the crèche rests within the palm suggests Warhol's longtime familiarity with the theme. Reclining Man, 1956-57. Warhol was open about his homosexuality and from the early 1950s produced drawings and illustrations that are technically fine and reveal a gay sensibility that ranged from the playful to the slyly suggestive to the explicit. Reclining Man is one of a series of homoerotic drawings where this beauty of line and playful sensuality can be witnessed. Untitled, circa 1958. Warhol's early drawings of religious themes come from the years when he was working in New York as a commercial artist. For Tiffany and Company, he did a series of drawings for Christmas cards. Several charming drawings of a star show Warhol's fanciful variations on the theme, The Star of Wonder. The title comes from the refrain of a familiar Christmastide hymn. This drawing shows brilliantly colored birds clustered in a star shape. Star of Wonder, circa 1958. Tiffany and Company chose this drawing and the card shows a star that is defined by the fluttering, wheeling birds surrounding it. On the face of the card, Andy Warhol was inscribed in the spiky penmanship of his mother, who signed many of his works in these years. Andy's renown in the world of commercial art and fashion gave his name value. Superman, 1961. The material for his first pictures was drawn from comic strips and advertisements that appeared on the backs of tabloids, as well as from popular comic books. Popeye, 1961. Saturday's Popeye, 1961. Batman, 1961. Dick Tracy, 1961. Dick Tracy and Sam Ketchum, 1961. Nancy, 1961. A Boy for Meg, 1, 1961. Coca Cola, 1, 1961. Coca Cola, 2, 1961. Before and After, 1, 1961. Before and After, 3, 1962. His creative procedure 
which from 1962 was generally based on the serial screen painting technique, corresponded to a technical and media-based approach. His works were produced in the conviction that a picture was not simply a copy of something, but instead represents its real essence. This is most obvious in Warhol's concentration on the phenomenon of the film star, whose reality is all image. The complexity of Warhol's art feeds on contradictions. His works reveal the gulf between reality and its pictorial reproduction, at the same time blurring the difference to the point where reality and image become one. Presence and absence merge with each other. What has been filtered seems to be unfiltered, and what has been unfiltered seems endlessly filtered. 1962. 1962. Do it yourself. Seascape. 1962. Do it yourself. Flowers. 1962. Do it yourself. Violin. 1962. Do it yourself. Landscape. 1962. Dance diagram. 4. 1962. Dance diagram. 3. 1962. Dance diagram. 6. 1962. One dollar bill. Silver certificate. 1962. 1962. The small format Campbell's soup can pictures were Warhol's first attempt at series painting, that is, using a succession of images based on the same motif in various paintings. Big Torn Campbell's Soup Can, Vegetable Beef, 1962. Big Torn Campbell's Soup Can, Pepper Pot, 1962. Campbell's Soup Box, 1962. 100 Cans, 1962. In the large-scale 100 Cans, in which he used photographic material for the first time, and in dollar bills, he experiments with grid-like arrangements of serial compositions within a picture. The cans and dollar bills spread out over the canvas, seeming almost abstract in their horizontal and their vertical system of coordinates. Front and Back Dollar Bills, 1962. Green Coca-Cola Bottles, 1962. Cherry, Maryland, 1962. Lavender, Maryland, 1962. Warren, 1962. Troy, 1962. The regular sequence of images in this work is an excellent example of the way Warhol used his silkscreen technique. The black and white images differ from one another only by the halftone in which each was printed, yet the silkscreen in the color portraits serves as a sketch that defines the actual features of the face. It is printed over the hand-painted yellow hair, violet face, and red pullover. Green Car Crash, 1962. Liz number one, 1963. Liz number two, 1963. Liz number five, 1963. Liz number three, 1963. Single Elvis, 1963. Single Elvis, 1963. Elvis two times, 1963. Double Elvis, 1963. Silver Liz, 1963. The Disaster Pictures, quite likely his most impressive and important series, reveal the dark side of American consumer positivism. The everyday tragedies of automobile accidents, suicides, major fires, and electric chairs join together to form an endless series, resulting in the death of their original meaning. Burning Car 1, 1963. Bellevue 1, 1963. 
Orange Car Crash, 1963. Silver Car Crash, 1963. Bellevue 2, 1963. Suicide, Purple Jumping Man, 1963. Black and White Disaster, 1963. In many of these paintings, the uniformity of the composition is interrupted both by overlapping and smudging the underlying image, evoking a seemingly narrative content and cinematic motion. Yet considered more closely, this sensation of time is just as misleading as in his first films. It is always the same shot and always the same silkscreened image. Suicide, Fallen Body, 1963. Orange Disaster No. 5, 1963. Gangster Funeral, 1963. Blue Electric Chair, 1963. Optical Car Crash, 1962. Silver Car Crash, 1963. Suicide, 1963. This shows a 23-year-old model that jumped from the observation deck of the Empire State Building to her death. When one first views the 10 by 6 foot painting, it is the abstract black pattern with its undulant highlighted forms that absorbs the viewer's attention. Then the multiple repeated images become clear. The model is serene and whole in death. Her body cradled on the indented top of a car, her face tranquil, her body relaxed, while her white gloved hand touches her pearls. As the eyes move down the painting, the images become less clear and overlap, leaving peripheral blank areas. Finally, in the last register, five images are overprinted, accelerating the rhythm and making the face and body of the pretty model increasingly unreadable, until in the lower right, she is lost in the pattern of dark and light shapes. Lavender Disaster, 1963. This photograph shows a room empty except for the electric chair, which is almost at its center, with light falling upon the chair. The single other visible object is a sign at the right proclaiming silence. In the lavender disaster, the repetition of this image is symmetrical with three images across the width of the painting and five laterally. A spectral light illumines the right-hand image, where the black shadows, which increasingly encroach upon the light, now encompass most of the room. The sign requesting silence is no longer visible. But the darkness of the lower right register seems less a negation of the image and its meaning than a coda to and a meditation on death. Flowers, 1964. The Week That Was, 1, 1964. Four Foot Flowers, 1964. Red Jackie, 1964. Twelve Jackies, 1964. Nine Jackies, 1964. Brillo Box, Brillo Box 3C, Off. Kellogg's Cornflakes Box. Mott's Apple Juice Box, 1964. Brillo Box, Campbell's Tomato Juice Box, 1964. Shot Sage Blue Marilyn, 1964. The four Marilyn pictures, later dubbed the Shot Marilyns, are today Warhol icons. The color of the hair, face, and lips are masterfully combined with the black of the silk screen. Shot Light Blue Marilyn, 1964. Shot Orange Marilyn, 1964. Shot Red Marilyn, 1964. Turquoise Marilyn, 1964. Flowers, 1964. Flowers, 1964. Two Foot Flowers, 1964. Colored Campbell's Soup Can, 1965. Colored Campbell's Soup Can, 1965.
Colored Campbell's Soup Can, 1965. Colored Campbell's Soup Can, 1965. Double Self Portrait, 1967. Ten Foot Flowers, 1967. Self Portrait, 1967. Big Electric Chair, 1967. In 1967, Warhol returned to the electric chair theme, producing a group of large, single images of the chair. By printing color on color rather than black over color, he created a vibrancy of close-toned, brilliant colored light. The chair is transformed from a grotesque instrument of death into a luminous object, suggesting transcendence, much as the cross, which was used for a particularly cruel kind of execution, is seen in Christian art as a symbol pointing to salvation. Mao, 1972. Mao, 1972. Katie Jones, 1973. Warhol's portrait of Katie Jones stares forth with something of the mute appeal seen in the eyes of the Egyptian Fayum coffin portraits. Done for the mummy cases of the deceased, the Fayum portraits were presumably painted before the deaths of their subjects, since they express so directly a sense of individual personality. Katie Jones' eyes, like those of the Fayum portraits, are riveting, claiming the moment, but focused beyond time. Portrait of Julia Warhola, 1974. Hammer and Sickle, 1976. The series of hammer and sickle paintings are an ever-changing cycle of still-life images in which the objects and their shadows create a fascinating puzzle. Hammer and Sickle, 1976. 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 Skulls, 1976. In 1976, Warhol did a series of paintings of skulls. The resurgence of skull imagery accompanied punk culture and is related to anxiety over the spread of AIDS, as well as the escalating threats of nuclear war and ecological disasters. The colors of the skulls are literally shocking in their brilliance originality, and unexpected juxtapositions, a pink skull against a green, turquoise, and apricot background, a beige skull which throws a black and scarlet shadow against an olive green and peacock blue ground, a Genetian blue skull with a jonquil yellow shadow and black and gunmetal ground. The placing of the skull varies, as do the shadow shapes, and the expression of the grinning skull differs in each painting, even though it was printed by the same screen throughout. The skull paintings are not only striking in size, but the luscious brushwork and color give this macabre subject a contradictory lyricism and gripping beauty. Skull, 1976. Skull, 1976. The shadow of the skull looks like the head of a fetus, thus death and life are here juxtaposed. Warhol subtly emphasized the fetal-shaped black shadow by placing it against a second colored shadow, which encompasses it and sets it off against the surface on which the skull is located. The beginnings of life, the fetus with its bulging head and tiny upturned nose, is here contrasted with the huge grinning skull with black, empty eye sockets. Self-Portrait, Polaroid Photograph, 1977. In this photograph, the vacuous, empty eye sockets of the skull make all the more riveting Warhol's eyes and his complex expression. Warhol's usually albino chalk skin is given a ruddy glow by makeup. 
Though his glance does not focus toward the spectator, his parted lips, with perhaps the beginning of a smile, suggest an accessibility that is markedly unusual in his self-portraits. The grinning skull on his shoulder, supported by a hand, seems in conversation with the artist. Self-Portrait with Skull, 1978. When Warhol was 50, he did a self-portrait based on a photo in this series. Warhol painted freely on the canvas, yellow, blue, red, and white, and then printed his own features and those of the skull in black outline. Both Warhol and the skull appear more spectral in the painting. The artist's face seems to disintegrate in front of our eyes. Oxidation Painting, 1978. Oxidation Painting, 1978. Shadows, 1978. When hung edge to edge in a large gallery, the paintings flow rhythmically around the four walls, encompassing the viewer with brilliant flashes of color in the flame-shaped repeated image, which is set against a richly black background. Shadows, detail, 1978. A second image, an attenuated triangle with a blurred left edge and two sloping vertical areas below, is repeated many times usually in black against brilliant color, turquoise, apricot, scarlet, a sharp chartreuse, and a soft first spring green. The shadows unfold on walls, creating a nightmare world, a shifting kaleidoscope of brilliant full-color life set against the black shadows of a final darkness. Shadows, 1978. Big Retrospective, 1979. Diamond Dust Shadows, 1979. Diamond Dust Shoes, 1980. Diamond Dust Shoes, 1980. Modern Madonna, 1980-81. The Drawing of the Mother with Child, is a 20th century version of the Madonna Lactans, or the mother with the nursing Christ child. The contours of the figures have an immediacy unusual in Warhol's work. It is also unusual in the way the figures fill the page, indeed seem to expand their limited space. The expression of absorption as the mother looks down upon her suckling baby and the dreamy gaze of the sensually satisfied child are arresting. Cross, Red, 1982. Nothing in Warhol's previous work prepares the viewer for this astonishing first large religious painting, The Scarlet Cross. Its grandeur, its spiritual resonance, and its sheer beauty are striking. The glowing cross levitates against a velvety black background. The feathering of the black paint along the edge of the cross delineates its side and then merges into the encompassing blackness. Cross, Yellow, 1982. Warhol, with his usual sense for drama, made the size of the painting taller than the average adult and its width greater than the average arm span. Thus, the cross is large enough to bear an adult human body but rather than suggesting the cross of crucifixion, this cross seems ethereal as it levitates before the viewer. It is a stunning painting, a joyous and breathtaking painting. Crosses, 12, 1981-82. Small wooden crosses, the kind available at religious supply houses, were multicolored, arranged in rows, or randomly placed. They suggest the simple crosses used in military cemeteries, row on row, an appropriate association for the Spanish Civil War. The lively staccato pattern of the small crosses against a dark background seems decorative and two-dimensional in contrast to the majesty of the single large cross paintings. They were done for an exhibition in Madrid, a show entitled Guns, Knives, and Crosses. 
Eggs, 1982. The egg has a long history of symbolic associations, from the prehistoric tombs in Russia and Sweden, where clay eggs are presumed to be emblems of immortality, to the Easter eggs, which symbolized resurrection. Warhol's mother had followed the Byzantine Easter practice of painting eggs. Warhol's first egg designs were small works on paper, but he also did large silk-screened canvases in a range of brilliant colors that correspond to those available in the PAS egg dyeing kits to be found in supermarkets at Easter time. These paintings have stunning designs with the figure and ground locked together in a breathtaking balance. The colored eggs seem to both tumble freely against the black background and to be integrated into space, suspended but immovable. They can be seen as exuberant abstract designs or as a kind of doxology, a cry of praise. Leonardo da Vinci, The Annunciation, 1472. Warhol's manipulation of the Renaissance paintings was through radical cropping, so that the subject matter of the original is all but unreadable. In addition, the subtle and darker palette of the Renaissance masters is replaced by a cacophony of day-glow colors that assault and delight the eyes. Details of the Renaissance paintings. Leonardo da Vinci, The Annunciation, 1472, 1984. This canvas shows the angel Gabriel kneeling on a grassy, flower-bestrewn lawn before the Virgin, who sits at an elaborate and obtrusive lectern. Warhol has eliminated the foreground and the figures and focuses instead on the landscape with its violet, triangular mountain, which joins the expressive hands of Gabriel and the Virgin. The angel's hand is erect and urgent, and the Virgin's fingers are spread responsively as her hand rests on the corner of the lectern. Warhol used brilliant, high-keyed, and non-naturalistic colors and printed them in four different color combinations, all of them stunningly original. Details, Renaissance paintings. Piero della Francesca, Madonna del Duca da Montalfetro, 1984. We see a Renaissance architectural niche that numinously embraces a seashell, from the tip of which hangs suspended what seems a surrealist addition, an ostrich egg. The shell suggests a womb shape, within which the ovoid form of the large egg floats before us. Details Renaissance Paintings Paolo Uccello, St. George and the Dragon, 1460, 1984 Warhol's translation of the princess and the dragon's spiky spotted wings and corkscrew tail suggests a segment of a comic strip rather than an episode from the legendary life of St. George. Is Warhol showing us that the feats of heroism and daring do that make up the lives of the saints are now to be found in the comics? That the exploits of Superman and Dick Tracy are this century's mythology? Details, Renaissance paintings. Piero della Francesca, St. Apollonia, 1984. In this case, it is Warhol's fidelity to the original painting that is noteworthy. The frontal iconic image of the saint is replicated with little marginal cropping. Even the cracks in the paint surface are delineated in Warhol's print. St. Apollonia, the patron saint of dentists, who is said to have had her teeth torn out in an assault intended to make her recant, stands serenely before us, holding a pincher with one of her molars in its grip. Rorschach, 1984. Rorschach, 1984. Raphael, 1, 699, 1985. This looks back to Warhol's pop paintings, with its imaginative manipulation of the image and the jolting addition of a commercial price tag. It is this bright red and yellow price tag that leaps out at the viewer obtrusively. 
It hangs behind the head of Pope Sixtus, but in front of the arm of the Christ child. We do not see the drapery rod at the top or the windowsill below Raphael's misty, cloud-filled, cherub-filled setting. Instead, we experience the exuberant play of Warhol's wiry line and the presence of a second image, a pink, pink Christ child, illogically placed horizontally below. Heaven and Hell are Just One Breath Away, 1985-86. Warhol finally created paintings in which his secret but deeply religious nature flowed into his art. The Last Supper, 1986. Andy's last great work, the Leonardo Last Supper, was commissioned by Alexander Iolas, the art dealer, early in 1986. He used encyclopedia illustrations of Leonardo's painting that were reduced to traced, artless boundary lines. A comparison of the encyclopedia illustration with a painting from Warhol's Last Supper series reveal how closely Andy followed the illustration. He himself called it his plagiarist style. Not only are the facial features and gestures the same, but details such as the shadows are composed of parallel hatchings that are similar. A striking difference, however, is Warhol's omission of the architectural setting and tapestry hangings on the wall. The figures about the table thus appear monumental in size, and the table seems to be pressed into our space. The Last Supper Detail, 1986. Warhol was wholly absorbed with the Last Supper paintings in this last year of his life, working on little else. He did the head of Christ over and over again, and also sketches of Christ's hand next to the glass of wine. The Last Supper, Detail, 1986. This group of drawings is both finished works of art and studies, studies that fed onto the eight or more huge hand-painted canvases of the entire composition. The Last Supper, Wise Potato Chips, 1986. The scene is set before us, but our attention is riveted by the huge, brilliant blue and black logo that rotates in space between us and the table, obscuring some of its occupants. The Wise Potato Chips logo is an abstracted head of an owl compressed into a circular design. It is an advertising device with a play on the word wise since the owl is a symbol of wisdom. Detail from the Last Supper, Wise Potato Chips, 1986. Be somebody with a body, with Christ of Last Supper, 1985-86. The large double painting, Be Somebody with a Body, crowns the series of this title. The image and title are taken from an advertisement for bodybuilding. The healthy young man with arms crossed cover his bare chest, who looks expectantly upward, is repeated in several forms by Warhol. The Christ, large in size and physicality, seems to reach with his left hand toward the young man linking the Christ with the smiling young man whose head is haloed. The black contours of Christ are inscribed against a phosphorescent white background, which contrasts dramatically with the dark zone surrounding the bodybuilder. The luminosity of his body and the encompassing white radiance about his head show him transfigured and haloed. Be somebody with a body, with Christ of Last Supper, 1985-86. Some of these paintings have the figure of Christ of the Last Supper superimposed over the young bodybuilder. The Last Supper, The Big Sea, 1985. The boldest of the hand-painted canvases based on Leonardo's Last Supper is the 30-foot-long canvas titled The Last Supper, The Big Sea with four images of Christ and the group at the left of Thomas, James, and Philip painted in various sizes with the startling addition of three motorcycles as well as logos and a price tag. 
The primary colors, red, yellow, and blue, highlight the logos and the largest motorcycle. In this fast Last Supper painting, the reference to the fearful scourge of cancer, the Big C, is surrounded by small, big, and bigger images of Christ. The Christ is another Big C. The Last Supper, Dove, 1986. Our attention is riveted by the obscuring and alien commercial logos that jump forth at the viewer. The corner of the price tag for 59 cents, the Dove Soap logo, and also the General Electric logo. The wit and humor of juxtaposing the sacred and the secular engage and startle the viewer. Dove in word and image is familiar from Dove soap packages and GE from packaged light bulbs, electricity and soap, thus power and cleanliness. Some will remember the old adage, cleanliness is next to godliness. Significantly, the Dove levitates above the head of Jesus. Andy would have known the accounts of the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist when the heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descending upon Jesus in bodily form like a dove. As for GE, we bring good things to light, can be seen as a metaphor for creation, when God separated light and darkness and found his creation to be good. God brings good things to light. GE as a symbol for the Creator, the Dove for the Holy Spirit, and Jesus here delineated at the Last Supper, the three make up the Holy Trinity. The price tag? Does it mean everything can be purchased? Or perhaps the meaning that not everything can be purchased? Or again, the 59 cents, which even in 1986 would not have bought much, may refer to a devalued currency and devalued religious images, which are here juxtaposed. This arresting painting suggests multiple meanings. Ten Punching Bags, with Christ from Last Supper. The strangest of all these Christ images are the ten white boxers' punching bags, which have the Christ image drawn on them by Warhol with additional designs and phrases painted by Jean-Michel Basquiat. Christ 112 Times, 1986 In this vast panorama of repeated images, the face, features, and shoulders of Christ at first lose their identity and dissolve into an abstract pattern. But gradually, the faces recover their identity, then are lost again, in the wave-like motion of the seemingly overlapping contours. The repetition is incantory and may, for the attuned viewer, act as a visual chant. Warhol had a special sense for shape and size. Here he pushes dimensions to the limits, suggesting indeed that the images could be repeated beyond space and time infinitely. The Last Supper, Pink 1986. When one first sees the pink Last Supper, there is a moment of shock at viewing two replicas of Leonardo's original mural set side by side. The ambient pink pinkness of the scene is also startling. But it is surprising how quickly seeing and feeling are accustomed to this doubleness and this pinkness. The Last Supper, Red, 1986. At first viewing, this glowing red painting is startling with its upside-down panels adjacent to right-side-up panels. The effect should be disorienting, or at the very least, disquieting. The strong vertical of the glowing red tablecloth with the velvet black shadows below the cloth knit the composition together. Looking from left to right, this black and red horizontal is at the upper border and continues to alternate top and bottom as the eye moves from left to right. The rhythm of these alternations is slow-moving and lyrical. Detail from The Last Supper, Red. The Camouflage, Last Supper, 1986. The camouflage pattern spills over the vertical edges, 
functioning as a kind of frame on either side. The camouflage pattern covers and partially veils the features of Jesus' face, as well as the faces of the two groups of apostles to the left and right of him. In the groups at either end of the table, the picture puzzle pattern of camouflage has odd-shaped, light-toned areas that seem to highlight the eyes of Simon and Jude at the extreme right in both scenes. The Apostle Jude, who is second from the right, looks anxiously and searchingly towards us. The three apostles at our left, Bartholomew, James the Greater, and Andrew, seem to peer at the Christ with intensified emotion. Detail from the Camouflage Last Supper Last Self-Portrait, Camouflage, 1986 He used the camouflage pattern for this late self-portrait in which a very large image of a cadaverous, white-wigged, tragic-looking Warhol peers toward the viewer with an unfocused, far-seeing gaze. The Last Supper, Christ, 1986 this Christ image, silk screened over pieces of colored paper that have been adhered to a heavy sheet of background paper, is lyrical and reverential. Isolated from the actions of the apostles, and with the setting of the room minimized, the focus on the Christ is intensified. We become aware of the inward and remote expression of his face, and how it contrasts with the self-offering gestures of his hands. Sixty Last Suppers, 1986. The viewer is impelled into a physical relationship with it, for the entire painting can only be seen by stepping way back from the wall where it hangs. Then, having studied the grid pattern of repeated images, we are drawn forward to examine the individual images, how they are joined, how the blackness of the left and back walls in the repeated rooms makes the light on the right wall and the light about the 60 times repeated Christ seem phosphorescent. The Last Supper, 1986. Camouflage Boys, 1986. Joseph Boys, 1986. Joseph Bays, 1986. Self-Portrait, 1986. Self-Portrait, 1986. Skeletons, 1987. The composition is made up of four stitched together photographs of skeletons. The dynamism and beauty of the skull paintings contrast in mood and in medium with these starkly lit black and white skeletons who are in search, it seems, of something, their past fleshy selves or an identity for their anonymous gropings. Andy Warhol's studio at the time of his death. The picture shows a moment arrested in time, when the artist's presence seems almost palpable, before inventorying and removal of the contents of his studio. Program for the Warhol Memorial Mass at St. Patrick's Cathedral, 1987.